we start with the multiplier. So this gray part here is everything that you and I must know for the multiplier. Can you see that there's no discussing detail or anything like that? So the maximum amount of marks that we can ask or can be questioned on the multiplier is a maximum of eight when it's one of our 2.4 or 2.5 questions, or maybe they can give us a graph like the one we're going to look at in our PowerPoint. Maybe they give us a little extract like this, and then the maximum amount for this question is 10 marks. But remember learners, they're not allowed to ask you more than four marks higher order question when it's a data response question. So sometimes in my class, these learners that sure they struggle with the multiplier and then I tell them relax, ladies and gents. I mean, the, it's not like you can't answer anything in the paper. You might not be able to do the higher order bit, but the rest is straightforward and I'm going to show you how to do this. So I'm going to switch off the camera for now. And I want us to go to this question that you guys that we worked on last week. OK. So let's see what they ask here. They ask us country A has a closed economy without a government. OK, so they're basically telling us if we look at this economy, normally we have four role players. We have our businesses, our households, our government and the foreign sector. But yeah, they are telling us it's closed, so we don't have a foreign sector. And they're telling us there's no government. So we immediately know we only have households and businesses. OK. So now they say the government has taken a decision to expand the national road network by 250 million rand a year. The citizens consume 80%. So what does that mean? They spend 80% of all their income earned. Okay, so I always tell my kids, <laughs> I tell them, humor me. Let's see what they ask us. So remember learners, um, we, we spoke the last time and we said that um, you had to complete these questions on your own, so I really hope you did do it. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on, on, on working it out. I just want to explain the answers to you. So let's start here with identify one participant in the economy above. One role player. So remember by way of eliminating, we eliminated the foreign sector and we eliminated the government. So if you look at the answer, you could only answer one of two things, either the households or the businesses. So you only had to give one. Don't waste your time in writing more than one. They ask you for one. It's a lower order question. It's one. Now they ask us, what percentage of the income do households save? So I just explained to you. If we spend 80% of our money, then the rest will be saved. That's the assumption we make because the multiplier, uh, when we look at the marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save, when we add to the two together, they will always be one. On that note, I want to tell you, guys, don't let the, the uh, uh, um, Fancy wording throw you. Look at the last word. It's the MPC and the MPS. What does it stand for? Consume, save. And then we just give it a fancy name. Marginal propensity to save. Marginal propensity to consume. But you only need to know it's consumption and it's saving. Okay. Explain the term multiplier. Please don't write ripple effect because they're not going to give you the mark for it. You must know this definition. You know these little white papers I've ha I have? I told you this the previous time as well, and my grade 10s are actually doing it this year. I'm giving them 
um, paper and they sitting in class and we making our own little flashcards. So on the one side you write multiplier and on the other side you write the definition. And, and it's almost like a game you can play with your friends. So throw the play flashcard, multiplier, and it says it occurs when a small increase in spending produces a larger income, a, a increase in national income. That is a straightforward definition. Can you see what I, I was trying to tell you with our data response question? that you already have one, two, three, four out of 10 marks just because you know the definition of the multiplier. So this doesn't have to be high order where they catch you out, guys. OK, let's go on to the next question, 5.4. This is interesting, guys. Forget about the answer. Just listen to the question first. How will an increase in government spending affect the size of the multiplier? Learners, think about it. How will more spending affect our economy? Do you agree that if we spend more, more money is in circulation? And that means that our economy is growing? Of course. So we're busy with a circular flow and we want to see how much money moves around in this economy. And if there's more spending by the government, we are injecting money and we are growing muscles. So let's see what they say here. Um, but, so this is a how question. Oh, we love the how questions in economy, economics. And I remember this so well from, from a... Um, from a road show we once had with Mr. Green. How will an increase in government affect the size of this, this multiplier? So, OK, we know the multiplier will increase, but that's not the question. How will it lead to this uh, um, increase in, in multipliers? So here they say, improving the overall efficiency of the economy through infrastructural development thus increasing income earned and the size of the multiplier. I'm going to explain it to you now. Creating job opportunities, which will increase consumption spending, thus kicking the multiplier. OK, let's start with this one. If the government spends more money, OK, let's take an example. They are going to build a nice new hospital, a big hospital. So they are injecting a billion rand into our economy. What will happen? OK, so we need a builder. Remember, this is the this is my example where Mr. Green gives us the 100,000 rand. It's the same thing, but it's just the government spending the money in the economy. So a billion rand is going to be spent on. We need a builder. We need an engineer. We need a plumber, we need an electrician, we need an architect, we need a lawyer, we need builders, we need painters. Can you see what I'm trying to say? If the government spends more money, more people will have more money. And if we have more money, we will spend more money, i.e. creating a bigger ripple. We will have a larger multiplier. I hope this makes sense, learners. Um, let's do number 5.5. .5. Calculate the change in national income caused by investment. Show all the calculations. OK, so let's start first with in your notes with the two formulas. Can you see that formula one and formula two is basically the same thing. Why do I say that? Because one minus MPC is MPS. Think about it. If I take my one rand that I earned and I subtract the 80% or the 0, 0,8 that I saved, I will get my 0, 0,2. 
So can you see it's the same thing? So if they give me any one of the two um, figures, I can immediately use either one of these formulas. Okay, so let's put it into practice. They ask us the change in national income. So here you must be careful. This is something interesting. My learners in class wanted to take it just up to there. They didn't give me the multiply effect. You must read carefully. They're not asking just for the multiplier. They are asking the change in national income. OK, so we start with a formula. 1 over 1 minus NPC. So it's basically 1 over 0, 0,5. And that gives me a multiplier of 5. So learners, this means for every one rand additionally spent in this economy, we will generate five rands worth of income. So they told me they are going to inject 250 million rand. So we want to show them what is the multiply effect of that. That 250 million rand will become five times more and it, we will end up with an additional income of 1,250 million rand. Sure, that's nice. So can you see currently in South Africa, the government should be spending all their money on us, the citizens, because we are in a downswing in our economy and we're going to get there in the next chapter, but it's not going well with our economy. So we want the government to inject more money so that we can get this positive ripple effect. Sure, check it this nice graph that Mr. Green gave us. I'm going to make this big screen. So don't let this make you nervous. Because it's just another way to show you how we can calculate the multiplier. Okay. okay. So can you see on this side, this is our consumption and this is our income. So I want to give it, I, I like to rather use the word expenditure and income. Okay. So this line over here is what we call a scale line or a 40 degree line or a Keynesian equilibrium. Now, and this is where the kids get confused. In a perfect world, which is now not South Africa, nay? I mean, we're not living in a perfect world. There's a lot of factors that plays a role. But in a perfect world, if we have 10 Rand in our economy, that is the only money we have. So the 10 Rand can only be 10 Rand, can only be 10 Rand. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say we are one person in this economy. So I live in my house, but I also go to work, okay? So I'm going to work and I earn a salary of 10 Rand. Now I go back home, oh, and I'm hungry. So now I buy a burger from the business, but I only have 10 Rand. So that's the only amount I can spend. How many burgers do you think the business will actually produce? They will only produce the amount that is demanded. So production is 10 Rand, income is 10 Rand, and expenditure is 10 Rand. And that is what we see here. Check there, where our expenditure equals our yield, our income. So if we look here at number E, can you see that our expenditure is 20 Rand and our income is 20 Rand? OK, but now this is the perfect world. This is the reality. So this year they are showing me that if we spend 10 Rand, our income will be 
20 Rand. So I can immediately see just by looking at this that for every one Rand spent, two Rand is generated. So can you see just by looking at this, my multiplier is two. Every one Rand spent, two Rand is generated. So let's test the theory. So for every 40 Rand that is spent, if the multiplier is two, I will draw my line. Oh, where's my mouse now? I will draw my line and my income will be 80. Okay. Now when, oh, when my learners see this, they get very worried. Please don't. Can you see that we are just showing you here that the yield, the spending we spend 0.5 Rand or 0.5% or 50% of what we earn. So can you immediately see my MPS is 0.5 and my MPC is 0.5. OK. Let's go on. So let's study this graph. They are saying, a change in household and government expenditure. So let's see what happened here. Can you see that this line K is our perfect world? So if we were to draw a line to there and a line to there, it will give us income equals expenditure. But now they're showing me here that we started out with spending, let's just say 20 Rand, and we upped our spending to 30 Rand. Can you see the difference there is 10 Rand? Okay, so we spent an additional 10 Rand. Now we want to see that additional 10 Rand that we spent, how much money did we actually generate? Eh? Okay. So can you see, we initially generated 60 Rand from the 20 Rand, but with an additional 10 Rand injection, we now generate 100 Rand. So can you see the difference between these two is 40? So for every additional 10 Rand we spend, an additional 40 Rand is generated. Okay, let's see what the questions are. How many participants in the circular flow are displayed in the graph above? So they just want you to know that we are spending and we are producing. So it's the households and the consumer or the, uh, ach, the households and the businesses or the consumer and the producer. It's these two participants. Learners, and if you don't completely understand it, study it. It is a lower, wish, a lower order question that they love to ask. So you know it is two participants. Now they ask us, identify a point on the graph where leakages from the economy are equal to the injections. So learners, isn't it just that where my, nay, there by my equilibrium marks, where my income um, cuts my expenditure, if I can say it like that. So it's either point E or either point E1. That is where my leakages and my injections, my income and my expenditure are equal. This is also one they love to ask. What is the function of the broken line? This line over here, what is the function of this? For two marks, it indicates all the points where income, income equals expenditure, where my 10 Rand is my 10 Rand. But now, this is most the perfect world. This is not reality. We have now seen that an additional 10 Rand injection here will lead to an additional 40 Rand's worth of uh, income. OK, 
Okay. Number 6.4. Briefly explain the multiplier effect on national income. Guys. How will more spending, okay, how will a larger spending propensity lead to a larger national income? So, the more we spend, the larger the national income. Why? Because the more we spend, the larger the multiplier, i.e. the more the national income. So, let's see how they give us the answer. An increase in injections into the economy. And then they give us the three injections, investment, government spending, export, which would lead to a proportional increase in national income. Can you see it is so straightforward that you can literally say an increase in injections leads to higher national income? That's it, it's two marks. It, second bullet, extra spending, would have a knock-on effect and create even more spending. The more money I have, the more I spend. I'm going to use this example over and over again. Why does Snoop Dogg have 50 cars? Because he can. It's part of what economics is. Our social science to, to um, satisfy our unlimited wants and needs with our limited resources. The only thing is, Snoop doesn't have limited resources. He buys the 50 cars. So it's that extra spending that we put into the economy that makes other people rich. Okay, it says here, the size of the multiplier also depends on the level of leakages. So the more leakages we have, the smaller the multiplier. The smaller the multiplier, the less national income. Remember learners, if you see the word national, it means South Africa. So how much money does South Africa have? Do we have more or less? Okay, let's see the last one and this is the higher order one. So I want to take you back to the notes. Formula one, formula two is basically the same thing. They give us either the MPC or the MPS, and we can use Formula 1 or 2. But if we don't have the MPC or the MPS, we have to use Formula 3. Okay, oopsie. Oh, hang on. Sorry, guys. My mouse, there we go, It's giving me an issue. There we go. So can you see formula three? We look at the change in income over the change in expense. OK, so use the information above and calculate the size of the multiplier. The marginal propensity to consume and the marginal propensity to save. Sure, OK, so let's start with the multiplier. We just said the theory is we want to see the change in income due to the change in expense. So we made an additional increase in our expenditure from 20 million or let's just call it 20 from 20 to 30. So the change in the two was 10 or the difference between the two. So they're just saying maybe the government made some investment in infrastructure or they, I don't know, employing more people or they building more houses or they fixing the roads or they building a hospital. It doesn't matter. They put an additional 10 Rand into this economy. Now we want to see that 10 Rand what additional income did it generate for our economy? So our yield, our income went from 60 to 100. So we generated another 40 income. 
from this additional 10 rand. So we put our 40,000 over our 10,000 and we get a multiplier of four. I want to take you back to the graph. Don't make it more difficult than what it is. Can you see 10 rand more spent generated 40 rand more? So if I divide both sides by 10, I can just say 1 rand more generated 4 rand more. So then it's a 4 multiplier. I get 4 additional rands for every 1 rand spent in this economy. So now we've calculated the multiplier. But can you see that? Let me just see here. Can you see that they, uh, they've asked the multiplier, but now they also want the MPC and the MPS. So they want to know how much money do we actually spend and how much money do we save? So for every one rand we spend, four rand is generated. Okay, so we consume 0 0.25, other way around, we save, yeah, we consume, uh, sorry guys, we spend 0 0.75 and we save 0 0.25 and that gives us the 1. I think this is probably the trickiest one because you have to read from the graph the difference what injection was made there and what ripple effect did it have there but if you can just subtract these two from one another and put the differences on top of one another you get your multiplier okay country a has a closed economy without the government. Okay, so we already know no government, no foreign sector. The citizens save 40%. So what does your brain tell you? Okay, okay, lekker, 40% save, so we spend 60%. So I already know 0 0.4 plus 0 0.6, lekker. The national income increased to 300 million, from 150 million. And then they say the initial initial autonomous expenditure was 30 million rand. Okay, so now they're trying to throw you out, man, yeah, with a math lit uh, word sum. No, man, just check here. So we initially had 150 million spending, but we increased. Now I'm lying. The national income increased from 150 to 300 and we initially spent 30 million rand okay so let's see what they are actually asking okay identify the original equilibrium in income in the extract above so what did we initially initially generate it so let's just use this graph for a moment so I can show you visually. So they're saying that this 60 is actually 150 and it became 300. And they're telling me that the original expense was 30. So we're probably going to have to calculate that number there. Let me just repeat it because I know I'm going fast sometimes. I get so excited. So they're saying we had an initial income of 150 million rand and with the injection from the government or whoever, we are now generating 300. And they're telling us that my initial expenditure is 30 million. Okay, let's go and check what they're asking. So check here what percentage of income earned is consumed by the country citizens. So they're telling us we're saving 40, so we are spending, consuming 60%. Can I check here again? And this is all from old papers. 
Give me the definition of the multiplier. You must know this. When somebody wakes you at night and say, yay, give me the multiplier, you must be able to say it's the process whereby a small change in injections results in a proportionally larger increase in national income. That's the definition. I can't teach you anything more on that. That is straight study work. Sit on your bum and study. Okay. How does marginal propensity to consume relate to the size of the national income? Sure, learners, again, they're trying to throw you here with high English. What are they trying to ask you? How does our spending affect income? <laughs> so, one plus one is two. Ne? The more we spend, the larger the income. That's the bottom line. So they say here, yeah, higher spending, that's what they say with MPC, higher spending leads to higher national income. Lower MPC, lower spending, leads to lower national income. But I mean, you don't have to give both of them. There, you can just give that. And it is two marks for free. In Afrikaans, we say pasella, gratis. Ne? So the more money we spend, the bigger the ripple. Think of that stone you're throwing into the water. The more money, the bigger the ripples. Okay, and here comes the higher order question. There are 2.2, 3.2, 2, uh, and our 4.2 are data responses. And they must be mark allocated. 2.2.1 is always one mark, and it is lower order. 2.2.2. One mark, lower order. 2.2.3, two marks. Always a definition. So this is seen as middle order because you have had to study that. These two okies here, you normally get from your extract or your table or your cartoon. 2.2.4 is always two marks and this this is a i want to say a middle order to higher order question yeah they want you to apply something but if you practice these questions you will be able to apply it write it in your own language i again i know i sound like a parrot but learners when we start marking at the end of the year our chief marker always says, read everything and as long as it makes economic sense. So put it in your own language. And then 2.2.5, this is four marks and this is your higher order. This is where you must do some calculations and some interpretations. How, how why, evaluate. But can you see that this up to year six out of the 10 marks is straight forward practice practice study study and the same apply for our 2.3 questions 3.3 questions and our 4.3 questions they must always be data response and you get the marks like this okay so let's go back to the question can you see year is now our Higher order question for four marks. Calculate the amount of investment leading to this new 300 million income. So first of all, we must actually determine the multiplier. There, Mr. Green says, first determine the value of the multiplier. So it's straightforward because we have the NPS. So 1 over MPS gives me the multiplier of 2,5. Okay, work out. Then they ask me, now we must actually calculate what was this additional injection? 
So we take our money that we're making now minus the money we initially made, and then we divide it by 2,4 to see how much did we actually inject in this economy to generate the 375. It says here, what was the amount of the investments uh, that led to the new national income? Um, I just want to check here, national income increased with one from 130 and divided it with a multiplier. Yeah, I just want to check, I don't think that answer uh, is 100% correct. Let me just get my calculator out here. Just give me one second. Yeah, you must just check here. The, um, the answer must be 60. It's 60 here. It's not 375. Because if you subtract the 300 from the 150, you get 150 and you divide it by 2,4 and you get 60. Because the question is the following. We want to know, if I take you back to this graph, we want to know those two figures and those two figures. So we have the 150 and we have the 300. They gave us the 30 and now we are calculating it to be 60 over there. And how is it? It's a nice way of, of testing it. So if this is, hang on, um, myself, I'm confusing myself here. I just want to check. So if that is, um, so this amount here, yeah, it is 60. Because if I take the 90, the 60 change times the 2,5 multiplier, I do get this difference, the additional 150 million or 100, 150,000 million that was generated. So just please make sure that this answer here is actually 60. I hope I didn't confuse you now. It's difficult not with a board in front of me. Okay. Is everybody all right? Let's continue with the learner's self-assessment. So let's see how smart you guys are. You were supposed to do this and this again is old question papers. Practice, practice, practice. Let's see. The circular flow model consists of production, income and spending. Why? Because if we look at the three ways to calculate the, the GDP, can you see? We have the production method the income method and the spending method. Okay, next one. In the simple circular flow of economic activity, goods and services flow via the goods market from the firms to the households. Think about it. This is not too difficult. So they are saying, I'm in my house and I want to go and eat a burger at McDonald's. So how does that burger get to me? It goes from the firm, from the business, to the household, through the goods and services market. Okay, I hope you got that one right. Let's check the next one. Oh, Withdrawals of money, which will reduce the quantity of money in the economy, is called leakages. This is one of your flashcards. Leakages on the one side, definition on the other side. Next one. These figures provide a systematic record of national economic activity. The system of national account. Make a little note there, guys. The abbreviation is the SNA. Oh, they love this. Why do we have this? Because all countries, um, part of the um, United Nations, we all make use of the same system. So it is systematic and we include certain things and we don't include other things, but we can, can, can compare the same things with one another. 
So if we calculate that Japan's economy is worth $10 and South Africa's economy is worth $8, we know the same formula was used and we can say, okay, so Japan's economy is stronger than South Africa's by looking at that amount. And because we know Japan uses the same system of national account. Okay, number 1.5. The concept that explains how a relatively small investment may bring about relatively big changes in the national income is known as the multiplier. Multiplier, multiplier, a flash card. Let's do this. Okay. Let's see the answers for this one. Number 2.1, a real flow. So let me just check here. Real flow is the number B. It consists of goods and services and factors of productions. It's the real stuff that we can touch and feel. Disequilibrium. Okay. So what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is when something is equal, but now we're referring to a specific something. We're referring to leakages and injections. So obviously a disequilibrium is the opposite, is when leakages and injections are not equal. So it can either be more or less than the other one. So number 2.2 .2 will be D, when leakages are more than injections. Number 2.3, gross fixed capital formation. Oh, I can see here's actually the answers. Apologies, let me do this. Gross fixed capital formation, it's expenditure on assets used repeatedly in the process of production. So we, I mean, I think of, I think of a factory, machinery, equipment. So it's assets that we continuously use when we produce something. The marginal propensity to consume. It's the proportion. Proportion is a fancy word for the part, the, the amount of my income that I actually spend. So currently in my house with the economic situation, my whole salary I spend every month because I don't have any fat, if I can call it that, to actually save because of the way things are becoming more expensive. Okay. And then um, we must just check here. Yeah, this is um, this is actually. Just check here. Yeah, this is a, a, a repetition, but it's not the right thing. This one is E, 2.3. Can you see the explanation or the description is correct, but that letter is wrong? This is E, and this is A. Expenditure that is independent of the level of income. Independent, not, not dependent. Okay. One word for, so I'm just going to quickly translate this because I see here it is in Afrikaans, but that doesn't matter. I teach dual medium. So money received without any productive service rendered, and we call that a transfer payment. I hope you got that right. That was actually tested in the uh, in last year's um, one word section and very few learners got it right. Spending by firms, learners, if you see the word firm, don't get thrown. It's just a fancy word for business. So spending by businesses on capital goods and we call this investments. The initial value in production of final goods before taxes and subsidies are considered. So this is at basic prices. 
basic prices. Your final price is the market price. And we just had this a minimum level of consumption that take place even if the consumer has no disposable income. And that is what we call the autonomous, I don't think I pronounced it correctly, autonomous um, consumption. consumption. My learners get confused with this. They don't understand this because they say, how can you consume something if you don't have any money? Think about it. I mean, how many people use water even though they are um, unemployed? How many people use the roads even though they are unemployed? Uh, the roads is not a silly example, but I mean, we do still use things even though we don't have um, um, additional income or disposable income. Okay. Why are households regarded as the primary participants in the circular flow? I'm busy with my grade tens now with this, and we say, why? Because they are the owners of factor of production. And why is that relevant? Because we can't make anything of nothing. We need the factors of production. It is the starting point of the economy. And that is why we call them the primary participants. Um, I, my learners did the, um, the task um, last week and today they finished. And I asked them, who is the largest contributor in the economy? And it's the consumer. We spend the most and we take your yeah, because we are the owners of factors of production. List any one aggregate measures of economic activity. So they're asking you, how can we measure economic activity? So we can determine the standard of living. So what does standard of living mean? Standard of living is literally how many people, what they did with the census right now? How many people have a washing machine? How many people on average stay in a household? Do you have internet? Do you have how many toilets per person in the household? That's what they look at. They, um, I did my degree in marketing and they refer to something called the LSM 1 to 10 group. LSM 1 being your poorest, and LSM 10 being your richest. So these people will have probably more than one toilet per person in their household where these people might share or might not even have. So if we determine the standard of living, we can determine how good our economy is doing. We can compare our prosperity levels between countries or we can look at the economic growth year on year. If we had better economic growth this year, then we are doing better. Our economy has grown. Okay. Explain the purpose, the function, the goal. What is the reason for the system of national accounts? Why do we calculate GDP? Why do we want to know that? Because, and yeah, they basically give you the, the um, the definition of the SNA to provide an integrated, complete system of accounts, enabling international comparisons of all significant economic activity. I'm just going to leave it there for a minute. I think I might be going too fast. Let me just check the previous one. Are you guys still all right? Okay, number 4.4. Oh, this is also one they love to ask. Oh my word, what is the purpose of the residual item when the expenditure method is used to calculate national income? Okay, now I can't just answer this. I have to go and show it to you in the notes because otherwise we are just fooling one another. Let's check here. So they are asking, okay, 
Oh, I said no. There we go. When we use the expenditure method of calculating GDP, so we are looking at how much money is the consumers and the government and the businesses, how much money are all of these people spending? What is the purpose of the residual item? Please, 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 if you don't have it, make a note now somewhere and copy this. They love to ask it and I haven't actually seen it the past two years, so maybe this is the year. So the residual item takes into account errors and emissions that may have occurred in order to balance the GDP and the GDI equation. So remember when I said the 10 Rand equals the 10 Rand equals the 10 Rand. So sometimes it might be 10 Rand equals 10 Rand equals 9 Rand. And then they use that residual item to balance it out. So in that scenario, the residual item will be the one rand. Let me put it to you in my language, man, because in our daily lives, my learners had to come and tell me something interesting um, that happened in economics over the holidays. And one of the learners came with a very interesting article about um, a cash in transit van that was hijacked. But the hijackers were killed and the van actually exploded and the cash was lying on the floor all over. So the citizens in the area came and grabbed the money. I mean, I, I don't think any of us will just walk past money flying around. So they took the money and they went off on their merry little way. But now the cash in transit people, their insurance companies, or company still paid that money back. So can you see that's a situation where there's money in circulation that wasn't accounted for. So there was money spent, but we don't know necessarily on what. Think about all the money being spent on illegal gambling, illegal prostitution, drugs, all of that. We don't know that money. We don't know how much it is. So that is part of that residual item that we need to balance out the GDP figures. Okay, 4.5. Why uh, imports are subtracted in the expenditure approach? Okay, so this is not a very nice question, but they're just asking you, why do we subtract imports when we calculate GDP in our expenditure approach? because it is a leakage. It is money that is flying, leaving our country. Yes, we are getting Apple iPhones that we import, but our hard-earned South African rands are leaving the country. So imports are subtracted in the standard national income uh, because they have already been included as part of consumption, investment, government spending and exports. If imports were not subtracted, GDP would be overstated. I'm leaving that there for a minute. Okay, let's do the next one, 4.6. Ooh, how does an increase in saving, savings rate affect economic growth? Sure, this is an interesting one. So they want to know, basically, if we get a higher return on our investment, how will it how will it affect the growth of the economy? OK, 
okay? So they're saying here, a higher saving rate may result in more capital investment. So more people actually want to inject money and save it in our economy because they're getting a, a higher return. They're getting more money back. So when the borrowed money is spent, the demands for goods and services will increase, which will create more jobs. Interest is earned, OK? So you, you get a higher income, you get more money. And then they say low savings, which are low, maybe short term consumption over long term investment. High savings, increased income distribution in the country. So they're just saying the, the carrot that is dangling in front of our nose is that if I invest more money at a higher rate, I will get a larger return on investment. And that might lead to a further economic growth. Number next, I hope everybody's still okay. Almost done with this one. What impact will a tax increase have on the multiplier? So we've had a question like this before, but in short, if the government increases my tax, I have less money to spend. What do you know? about me spending less, the multiplier will shrink, be smaller, decrease. So it says there, it means that less money will be available to spend. And then, I mean, you don't even have to say that first sentence. You can just say the expectation is that the multiplier will decrease. And that's it, because I have less money that I can now circulate in the economy. Okay. Everybody okay? So before I do this presentation, let's quickly have a look at the notes. Again, guys, this gray part here in the notes is so wonderful and I'm so grateful for Mr. Green and his team for compiling the notes this way this year because it makes it so much easier. So if you scroll through the notes, you'll see this gray part here is always the exam guideline and what you must study. And this will guide you in how you will study the work. If they only ask you to briefly describe the concept, I mean, you basically need to know two, one sentence for two marks. So like this here, the definition of a business cycle. Don't study both of them. It's not a long question. Study one of them and ignore the other one because you know it refers to the phenomenon of successive periods of increasing and decreasing economic activity. That's enough. This is a flashcard business cycle and its definition. OK, so then we go through. I just quickly want to show you. So this can't be a long, long question learners. I mean, you don't even have to study it like a long question. No, the four phases or the four periods and the two phases going to go through that now and then we get our real cycle this is just what it looks like in real life then we look at why does these cycles happen some people feel it's stuff from the outside and some of it say says it's because from the inside we have a problem and then they give us um, four types or five types of business cycles then at number 2.3 what policies do we use to stimulate or shrink or dampen the economy? We use our fiscal policy and we use our monetary policy. But can you see learners? Again, 
this is not a long question. This is not an essay question. So how much do you need to study for um, of this? Please don't study every last word. They like to ask this. How can the government use the fiscal policy to stimulate the economy? Then you know, OK, decrease tax, increase government spending. You can just give a full sentence and that is more than enough. OK, then we scroll through. Yeah. The new economic paradigm. Discuss in detail. Learners, this was the long question in November 2021. So they will not test this again as a essay question. Now you must be careful. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying you don't have to study any of this. I'm just saying you don't have to study it like a long question. They can still ask you, explain inflation um, when you look at the economic paradigm, or they can ask you to explain the Phillips curve for eight marks, or they can ask you to um, explain the um, what can we do uh, from the supply side or what can the government do? They can ask you shorter questions like that, but it won't be a 40 mark essay question. Then we go on, but yeah, this is a possible long question. So can you remember in chapter one, we had a long question that was the market's long question. This is then question two for paper one. So you can go and work this out as a long question. How do you start? That first bullet, that's your introduction. See? So study that first bullet as an introduction. And then study this as if it is your essay question. See? Know that there's four different types of indicators and give examples of them. And then you must know what does the length of the business cycle and amplitude, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Be careful if they don't ask you in the in the in the test to draw a diagram. Don't draw a diagram because if they don't ask it, they you won't get marks for it. They draw a line through it, and that is basically this whole chapter. I think the most difficult thing in this chapter is the economic paradigm that the learners don't necessarily understand. So let's go to again. They are just going through our exam guidelines, showing me very nicely what it is that we must include and know. And as you can see, Mr. Green also shows us here. This was the essay in 2021. They won't ask it as an essay again. OK. This again, discuss in detail. You can go and work it out, my child. If you have studied your first long question markets and this one now, then you already have a good chance of knowing the long question for the end of the year. And then you can have 30 out of 150 already. Be smart about it. Ask your teacher to help you uh, work out a um, a conclusion so that you are sure you get your two marks for the introduction, your 26 marks for the body and your two marks for the conclusion. OK. So let's use this quickly and go through it. We all know, can you see that is moving up? So we call that a upswing, but we can also call it an expansion. I think of me eating too much cake. My waistline is expanding. It's getting bigger, so it is positive. Can you see that growth is taking place? But can you see this side is now the opposite? This is a we are shrinking. It is a downswing. We are contracting. Né? My one colleague always say it's like a contraction process here at school, giving birth. Né? It is difficult. Né? So this is our upswing phase with our highest point there being the peak. And this is our downswing with our lowest point 
being our trial. This is the, uh, the two periods we have here, or the phases, is my recovery and prosperity. Think about it, guys. You were in an accident and maybe your ankle got hurt. So now you are on crutches. You are, you are recovering. But yeah, oh yeah, they're taking off the band-aid and the crutches. And yeah, you are, it is prosperity. You are doing so well. Okay, then on this side, we have our recession. And then if we can't get out of the recession, we go into a depression. That is the worst of the worst. Do you see that South Africa is in a recession? Because we have had two consecutive quarters of negative growth. Check here, learners. This is the trend line. This is the trend that can you see? We are ending up at a higher point. We have a upward trend. Even though we've had some downs, we always end up at a higher point. And I mean, the basic thing is the population is growing, so there will always be a increase in economic activity over the long term. Check here, yeah. a peak, uh, a business cycle move either from peak to peak or trial to trial because we need to move through all four periods. So let's take this one, for example, A to E. We are going through a recession and a depression, recovery, prosperity. So can you see all four phases were included? So let's take it from C to D. Pros uh, recovery, prosperity, recession, depression. So we move through all four of these phases. OK. Can you see shortly describe a business cycle? I'm, um, so you guys actually have these questions in front of you, and I'm wondering now if we can give this as homework 